Hey, in today's Tales from the Vault, we are going to be traveling to Greene County, Tennessee, into the case of the Lily Lid family uh, crime. So, buckle in. This one is a little bit rough. We're traveling to Greene County, Tennessee today, where the unaliving of the Lily Lid family happened at a rest stop in Greene County. Uh, this one's a little rough because it involves some children. So if you, may, you may not want to hear this, so your discretion is advised. So let's get into this. <clears throat> On April the 6th, 1997, the Lily Lid family from Knoxville, Tennessee, parents Vidar and Delfina, six-year-old Tabitha and two-year-old Peter were heading home to Knoxville from Johnson City, Tennessee from a Jehovah's Witness convention. They pulled into a rest stop in Greene County in Northeast Tennessee. A changed meeting with six young people from Kentucky ranging in age from 14 to 20 proved fatal. They kidnapped the family, forced them to drive their van to a remote gravel road to steal it, lined them up along a ditch and unalived three of them. Peter hit twice with a projectile, was the sole survivor. When he was in the emergency room, no one knew his identity, so the doctors named him John Doe. Peter said later in life that he remembers not a single bit from that night. Two days after the crime, law enforcement tracked down the perpetrators in a stolen van at the Arizona-Mexico border. They were extradited to Greene County, where an angry mob was waiting. They shouted at the suspects as they walked into the jail. Meanwhile, Peter's aunt, Vidar's sister, Randy Heyer, and her husband, Odd, his name was Odd, traveled from Sweden to care for the toddler who lost an eye and suffered permanent neurological damage. They returned home with Peter and eventually adopted him. Vidar Lily Lid was 34 and his wife, Delfina, was 28. Joe Risner, Natasha Cornett, Karen Howell, Dean Mullins, Crystal Sturgill, and Jason Wright were passing through East Tennessee after leaving their homes in Eastern Kentucky. Some were friends, some had just recently met. They had a vague notion they'd drive to New Orleans or somewhere out west, but soon began having mechanical troubles with a the Chevrolet they had driven down from Kentucky. The perpetrators who had two firearms encountered the Lily Lids at an Interstate 81 rest stop in Greene County as the Lily Lids were headed home to Powell, Tennessee from a weekend at a Jehovah's Witness gathering in Johnson City. A Jehovah's Witness, Vidar, saw the young people and decided to strike up a conversation about their religious beliefs. Some of the groups saw an opportunity to steal the family's van. Within minutes, the Lily Lid would be held against their will by the firearms and forced to go with the young people to a gravel road off a nearby exit in Baileyton Tennis Community in Greene County. They then fired at Vidar, Delfina, and the two kids in a ditch, and alive in Vidar, Delfina, and Tabitha, leaving Peter critically wounded. Prosecutors said the suspects arranged the victims' bodies in the shape of a cross. They drove away in the family van, running over the adults and leaving Peter bleeding from his wounds. Tabitha passed the next day. The blue Chevy they had driven from Kentucky, they left it behind as well. Risner and the other five made it as far as the Arizona-Mexico border. They were arrested and eventually brought back to face a very angry local crowd. Some of the suspects insisted Bryant, too young to get the unaliving penalty, was the executioner, but authorities suspected more than one person played a part in the crimes. All six would ultimately agree to, a plea to plead guilty in a deal that called for them to spend the rest of their lives in prisons with no chance for parole. Several would later unsuccessfully challenge their sentences in the courts. Bryant argued a few years ago that it was unconstitutional for him as a juvenile to be held in prison without any chance of parole. Later, the U.S. Supreme Court turned back a challenge that would have helped Bryant's case. Bryant's case. Now, middle-aged, all six convicts remain in Tennessee prisons where they are to stay for the rest of their lives. Bryant was the youngest at 14 years old. In 2022, a Greene County judge dismissed a post-conviction request made by four people convicted in the Lily Lid crime. 
to have the weapon analyzed. Karen Howell, Dean Mullins, Crystal Sturgill, and Joseph Riesner filed a motion for the weapon used in the unaliving to be fingerprinted. The matter came before the court on August the 30th, and the court made a decision on September the 26th to deny petitions as well as the responses filed by the state. The court concluded a new fingerprint analysis would be of no substantive benefit to any of the juvenile defendants because they were ineligible for the unaliving penalty and that it would not take away from the horrific facts of the case. Bright claimed that Mullins and Risner were the per perpetrators. The six were offered a plea deal where the state would not seek the unaliving penalty and were given two days to consider the offer. They ended up pleading guilty to the crime and were sentenced. The ones who filed the petition said they believed they could have possibly received a lighter sentence if it were proven they were not the ones to fire the weapon. Berkeley Bell, former 3rd Judicial District Attorney General, recalled the Lily Lid case. He said the ritualistic nature of the unalivens and the evil demeanor of the six criminals still haunted him nearly 20 years later. John Huffman, the retired Greene County Sheriff's Department detective who investigated the Lily Lid case, described how the six teenagers kidnapped the Lily Lids from the parking lot. He reflected on the case at the spot in Baileyton where they were executed. Huffman believes the element just came together to make the random unalivings happen and to make solving the case possible. The scene still looks the same today at the spot in Baylington. Jason Bryant, age 15, was tried as an adult because the court ruled due to the cr cruelty of the crime. The six suspects were arrested by U.S. Customs agents on the Tennessee charges at the border. All six suspects claimed the unalivings were not planned and they didn't know what was going to happen when they were approached by Vidar. Each of the suspects had troubled and complex past, bringing them together on a dangerous collision course. Natasha Cornett left school before the end of the ninth grade with a criminal record dating from the age of 14 for thefts and assault on her mother involving threatening her with a sharp object. Her home life was disruptive with her mother in numerous relationships and different father figures coming in and out of Natasha's life. She began self-harming at a young age and attempted to unalive herself at the age of 13 with a period spent in a psychiatric care as a result. Natasha believed Satan existed. With an interest in spirits and demons, she had tried to make contact with them through various rituals, believing she could hear them talking to her. In a psychiatric assessment of the crimes, it was concluded Natasha was not psychotic, but there were mental and emotional disturbances with symptoms presented as bipolar and personality disorder. The youngest of the group, Jason Bryant, had a low IQ and underdeveloped social and emotional skills for his 14 years. As with Natasha, he had been abusing both drugs and alcohol from as young as nine years old and had some criminal history with joyriding, running away from home, and being out with the without control of his school featured in his record. Meeting Natasha just one month before the crime. She took pity on this lost boy after finding him at the streets on the streets of Kentucky and took him back to her home where she supplied him with alcohol. Edward Dean Mullins differed in that he did not have a history of substance abuse or criminal history. And those close to him felt his behavior changed once he began a relationship with Natasha Cornett. Joseph Risner, as with Edward Mullins, did not have a criminal record, but became involved in this group when he met them through his high school classes. Karen Howell had dropped out of school, age 16, and her early home life was glittered with violent fights between her parents. Karen Howell claimed she had suffered SA by an uncle from the age of five, and at 13 years old, like Natasha Cornett, had begun to self-harm with a number of self unaliving attempts reported. Involved in substance abuse misuse, Howell began to dabble in the occult, using Ouija boards and casting what she called love spells. Also with a low IQ like Jason Bryant, Howell was assessed as being ab able to engage well, but easily gives up when under pressure. With her poor judgment and reasoning skills, Crystal Sturgill had no prior criminal behavior, but had noted emotional neglect on her record due to her home life with her mother and stepfather. Four months before the crime, Crystal had accused her stepfather of S.A., dating back a number of years, to which her stepfather confessed to. 
Her mother, however, did not believe the alleged allegations despite her husband's admissions of guilt, causing a difficult rift between mother and daughter. Unable to stay living at home, Crystal moved from the family member to family member, being told to move on from each other after short periods of time. By the time she met Natasha, she had lived in over 13 locations. Since her reports of abuse four months earlier, accepting Cornette's offer of somewhere to stay after running out of options. At the time of the crime, Natasha was in relationship with 19-year-old Edward Dean Mullins, while Karen Howell was seeing 20-year-old Joe Risner, the oldest of the group. Joe had his mother's car before leaving Kentucky, and they stole two of firearms and a handful of cash, but what their intentions were has never fully been established. And what can be at least described as a collective of disturbed youngsters who wanted to push back at authority, this was a group which in their teenage angst and impulse thought they knew better and had something to prove. They wanted to make an impact, throwing their middle fingers up at parents, police, and everyone else who stood in their way. With exact plans for the trip have never been revealed, the decision to arm themselves with two firearms does not suggest they were going to go about their business quietly. There are numerous inconsistencies in the statements taken from the group once they were apprehended about their unalivings themselves. However, their police statements do agree on the events that led up to the crime. Vida had spoken to Natasha first. Then Joe had his eyes on the family van. Joe then returned to the group's car and told Mullins and Sturgill to be ready before walking back to Natasha and Vidar, who had P baby Peter on his knee. And pulling out a weapon, police received two 911 calls reporting sounds of a weapon being fired in Bailington around 9 p.m. that evening. When they arrived at the scene, they found an abandoned Chevrolet Citation with its license plates removed, and looking further, they made the horrifying discovery of four bodies in a ditch on the side of the road. Vidar and Delfina were already deceased, with their two young children barely alive. Medical evidence suggests the family had been lined up by the ditch and fired at one by one. Both parents had also been run over by a vehicle. Vidar was hit at least four times, once in the right eye and three times in his chest. Delfina was hit in the arm and then her leg, both wounds she would have survived, then hit an additional six times. Both parents had a triangle pattern in deliberately aimed hits on their bodies. Tabitha had been hit once in the head and Peter had been hit twice, once in the back of the head and once in the back. Tabitha was transported to the University of Tennessee Medical Center in Knoxville, where she passed away the next day from her injuries. The abandoned Chevrolet was Risner's mother's car and proved to be the link between the criminals and the crime scene. As police and forensic teams searched the area for, for evidence, the Lily Lids da Dodge van, now in the possession of the teenagers, was headed into Mexico after they abandoned the idea of going to New Orleans. After the crime, they had decided to continue their road trip with seemingly no remorse for what they had just done. When they tried to re-enter the U.S. at the border, the lack of correct papers and a license plate check on the stolen vehicle quickly put an end to their time on run and all six were taken into custody. Each time the group appeared in a court hearing, the public openly displayed their disgust at what these six teenagers had done and the media had, did not hold back on their reporting. Requests for separate trials were denied and it, a trial date was set for March 1998, once a suitable impartial jury could be found from a neighboring county. On February the 20th, 1998, almost one year after the crime, all six defendants pleaded guilty to the charges of unaliving and attempted unaliving, waiving their right to trial by jury. In their joint sentencing hearing, the trial court concluded that each defendant had played a role in these unalivings. Although it was acknowledged all of them did not pull the trigger firing the fatal hits, all were present through the kidnapping of the family and through to the passings doing nothing to prevent what was happening, despite ample opportunity to do so. The trial court believed Jason Bryant was either the only one to fire the weapon or one of the ones to do so in this case. Furthermore, they believed Joe Risner played a significant part in the instigating the events by threatening the Lily Lid family with a weapon with the help of Karen Howell at the rest stop and being the driver of the van when the group kidnapped the family against their will. Overall, the trial court opinions was that each of the defendants were involved in the crime against the Lily Lid family and each fled the scene, evading the police for two days, showing no hint of remorse despite the severity of the crime. 
Natasha Cornett, who many feel was the leader of the dysfunctional group, made a number of appeals against her conviction in the years following the crime, all of which were rejected. It was surrounding Natasha that the idea of a satanic worship first emerged when her original lawyer used the angle. It is believed to try and introduce mitigating circumstances for her upcoming trial actions, which it is now felt damaged her case and any hopes for freedom. Karen Howe tries to dispel some of the myths and hypes she states has been circulated about the case and their group since the crime in 1997. We were never a cult, she says. There were no satanic rituals performed over the bodies. There was no moving the bodies into the shape of a cross. There was no taking turns firing at the poor family. All lies heaped upon an already tragic happening to hype it more. I don't believe that I deserve to die in prison for this crime. I never thought or even wanted or intended that someone should lose their life, she said. Crystal Sturgill also stated, I would like to take this opportunity to apologize, not just to the Lily Lid family, but to the community, she writes. I realized that my inability to act altered more lives than I can imagine. What is it, while it is of little of any consolation, I have spent the past 20 years trying to atone, she said. When crimes as horrific as and as brutal as the lily lid crimes are carried out, there is often talk of evil taken over. And when the people who carry out such crimes are teenagers, the disbelief and horror is accelerated with the world wondering just what went wrong. The truth of exactly what happened at the side of that isolated lane in 1997, it appears we will never be sure of with the statements from these individuals. Still differing and contradicting each other. While for some, the opportunity to gain parole and be released from prison in the future is a possibility. It is still in the balance whether they will ever and should ever achieve that aim. Attorney David Horowitz said in a statement that one of the others told Bryant he would take the blame because he was the youngest in the group. That individual then pointed a weapon at Mr. Bryant, hit him in the hand, and threatened to unalive him if he did not. All the others, however, pointed the finger at Bryant as being the one and only one to fire the weapon. Each criminal received three life sentences and an additional sentence of 25 years for the attempted unaliving of, Pe of Peter. Bidar grew up in Bergen, Norway, and in 1985 moved to the United States. In 1989, he married Delfina Zelaya, a first-generation Honduran American from New York City, whom he had met through their common involvement in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Tabitha was born in 1990, and Peter was born in 1995. It was stated that eyewitnesses observed six youths in conversation with the Lilith family. Vidar, Carrie, and Peter had approached Natasha and Howell to discuss religion. Risner and Bryant joined the conversation. At some point, Risner displayed a weapon and said, I hate to do this to you, but we're going to have to take you with us for your van. As Risner directed the family into the van, Vidar pleaded with the group, offering his keys and wallet in exchange for being left at the rest stop but Risner refused. Risner, Bryant, Howell, and Cornette rode in the van with the lily lids. Bidar drove while Risner, holding the weapon on him, sat in the passenger seat. Mullins and Sturgill followed in Risner's car. In an attempt to calm her children, Delphina began to sing. Bryant reportedly ordered her to stop. Risner directed the lily lids first to the interstate and then to the secluded road at the next exit. The family was then lined up against a ditch along the road where they were fired upon. Checking the bodies, Bryant said, they're still effing alive and fired at them again. On the way back from Mexico, the group was stopped by the police in Mexico. They claimed they were lost. The police ordered the group out of the van and conducted a search, finding a sharp object as well as a photo album belonging to the Lilith family. They ordered the group to re-enter the United States where American Border Patrol agents searched them and subsequently took them to an Arizona jail. At the time of their arrest, two days after the crime, several of them had personal belongings belonging to the Lily Lids in their possession. <clears throat> Soon after Peter Lily Lids' medical condition stabilized, at the end of April 1997, a custody battle began between his maternal grandmother, Lydia Salaya in Miami, and his paternal aunt, Randy Heyer 
in Sweden, citing higher pledge to raise Peter in the faith and teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses as the deciding factor, local judge Fred McDonald awarded her custody on July 1, 1997. Peter was raised in Stockholm by Hire and her family. As of 2007, when he was about 12, he still had trouble walking because of his injuries. Edward Dean Mullins had no criminal history and was employed at a grocery store in Pikeville, Kentucky. His behavior grew worse after he began seeing Natasha. The two had discussed plans to wed. Joe Risner was born in Hazard, Kentucky. He never knew his biological father and took his stepfather's last name. He was described as a good student with a good work ethic and his mother and stepfather separated, which left him emotionally troubled. He had a history of marijuana, alcohol, and LSD usage, and he claimed he had relationships with two of his babysitters when he was 12. He failed seventh and eighth grade. He later joined the army, but was discharged after testing positive for marijuana during a drug screening. He earned his GED, on May the 26th, 1996, and was accepted at Mayo Regional Tech Center in September 1996. Crystal Rena Sturgill was born in Harold, Kentucky. Her mother refused to name her father, and his name doesn't appear on her birth certificate. She attended Floyd County Tech School. Records show she was an above average student. Sturgill's academic performance declined in high school, which she blamed on drugs and alcohol. She performed well on standardized tests, including a score of 28 on her ACTs and applied for admission to several colleges. She worked in the Betsy Lane Elementary School Daycare Co-op program, and her supervisors believed she was a good child caregiver. She had no prior criminal history, but had been suspended from school several times. She was friends with Edward Mullen and was critical of his relationship with Natasha. She had no history of violence before April 1997. Jason Blake Bryant was born in Hyler, Kentucky. He had an IQ of 85 and an emotional and social skills of an 11-year-old. He had a history of alcohol and drug abuse beginning at the age of three and was in eighth grade. He met Natasha in Pikeville a month before the crime. Karen Howell was born in Delaware, Ohio. Her family moved to Kentucky when she was three and her childhood was colored by violent fights between her parents until they divorced when she was nine. She was recorded as having a borderline slow IQ of 78. Due to SA as a child by her uncle and cousin, she described herself as being afraid of relationships. She engaged in self-harm and lived with her mother until she was 14. The two often fought. By her early teens, she was abusing drugs, particularly LSD. Aside from a bad trip, where she was tried to chew her friend's arm off, she otherwise had no history of violence and no criminal record before the crimes. Howell had a dysfunctional history with four previous unaliving attempts, twice by her wrist and twice by overdosing. She had drug problems, problem in school and problems at home, and she had run away repeatedly. She also developed an interest in witchcraft and the Ouija board and said she heard voices. Her mother, brought in ministers who attempted to cast out demons from her daughter. Howell said she created love spells to get boys to, to date her. She met Natasha and her boyfriend, Joe Risner, at school. After she dropped out of school, she moved in with her father and worked towards her GED. She was a minor at the time of the crimes and was saving to buy a car by babysitting full time. In 2007, 10 years after the crime, a local television station traveled to Sweden to see how Peter had adjusted to his new life 4,000 miles away from East Tennessee. He said his adopted parents never shielded him from the tragic truth. I have always known about it and have always had age-appropriate information about it. In a way, I have never been traumatized by the knowledge of it, as strange as it may sound, he said. Peter shared a jarring moment when he was four or five years old, riding in a car with his adopted father, Odd, quickly swerved. Apparently, they said it made me absolutely inconsolable. They suspected that it was something that was somehow related to what happened on that day in April, Peter said. Now, two decades later, Peter chooses to look forward, not backward. In 2019, Peter made the decision to move to the United States to work in the IT field. In 2020, he got married. 
He and his wife, Caitlin, have settled in Samford, Connecticut, about 45 minutes away from New York City. Caitlin said she was deeply moved when she learned of the crime, which to this day impacts Peter. The wound to his back left him with permanent neurological damage. He mostly uses a wheelchair and walking stick to get around, but the couple stays on the move. They recently traveled to Sweden to see his family and planned a trip to Knoxville. In fact, Peter has made regular visits over the years. It's my birth town, Knoxville. I know some people there. It makes for a good place to visit, seeing the folks and just having a good time, he said. During one trip, Peter reunited with the Knoxville police officer who kept watch at the door of his hospital room in the days following the crime. Despite all he lost, Peter gives little thought to the crime or the criminals who are now in their 40s serving life sentences. He has nothing to say to them. His message is to the people of East Tennessee and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for everything you did. It played out very well in the end, as well as it could have, Peter said. So that is the story of the lily lid and alive in Green County, Tennessee. I remember this. I remember when this happened. Sad, sad, the way that people, you know, young kids, their lives can just go off track so easily and an innocent family lost their life. And one little, and one little boy is impacted for the rest of his life without his family. So there's, I don't want to say, I hope you enjoyed this story, but I hope you found it interesting. Don't forget to tune in next week for another episode of Trails to the Bottom. I've not decided yet what it's going to be, but there will be another one. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, to hit that notification button, and to share this video. Until next time, bye.